but I would like to uh, introduce to you the main concept which we will be analyzing during this webinar. First of all, I would like to show what is the IRBB and why it is so important. We will be talking about the best practice and the main challenges uh, in the management or mismanagement. What are the consequences of the mismanagement of the interest rate risk? I will show some examples of the uh, financial institution which had the problem of mismanagement of the interest rate risk. What are the lessons learned? And first of all, what is the new regulatory landscape which has arisen recently and which was the um, hot topic uh, until um, the last year, until the end of 2019, because we had the regulatory deadline related to the implementation of the revised IRBB framework. Uh, before we start deep diving into the topic, let me um, provide you with them some small introduction which is based on my uh, recent observations. Um, I've participated in many conferences on IRBB, uh, on workshops, I delivered some workshop and I noticed that quite um, many people understand IRBB as a regulatory buzzword. Uh, so something which is necessary to deal with because it is required about the regulator. So the aim of this presentation is to show that it is not exactly only the uh, regulatory buzzword. Of course, we have to comply with the regulations and we have to deliver the revised IRBB framework because it was required and it is required by the FIDNI guidelines, especially in Europe and the European market uh, and uh, the regulatory, the, the local regulation, uh, which is mostly reflecting the Basel 368 requirement. But it is important because it is the main source of funding for the bank. Uh, because it has the impact on the capital and it is potential threat to the capital, uh, because the proper framework creates the opportunity for income generation both under the near term, uh, which is known in IRBB as the short term view, and for the medium long term horizon. And the proper steering approach or trade off between and a net interest income and economic value of equity. So we will be using these abbreviations during the webinar quite frequently. So when I will be talking about short view on IRBB or short time horizon, I will be referring to the net interest income volatility. And when I will be talking about the medium long part of the curve of view for IRBB, it will be mainly the economic value of equity sensitivity or volatility. And managing uh, the IRBB properly, as I said, creates an opportunity in order to um, minimize the volatility on of NII and uh, hedging of the NII compression and also it creates an opportunity for the future uh, cash flows and stabilization of the cash flows and uh, it is important to remember that we have many additional features which has been included into the guidelines so we have the credit spread risk in the banking book we have the modeling of non-maturity deposit we have the <clears throat> governance. We have now uh, the regulatory new uh, um, standardized view with the six regulatory scenario on the EV. But let's start from the beginning. So IRBB basically answers several questions. The first one is the main question, which for sure you have heard many times during the, your work career, is what will be the impact on our margins if interest rates go up by 100 basis points or uh, it will, when it goes down by 100 basis points? Um, 
please remember about the floors. We'll be talking quite a lot about the floors on um, on the on the rates zero floor, especially uh, when as far as uh, non-maturity deposit are concerned. And uh, what is the impact if the prepayments rise by 20%. Another question which is uh, related to the IRBB, what will be the impact on our margins in 2008-2019 credit crunch scenario or we, if historical scenario which has occurred in the past happens again. So 1994 rate hike scenario, what is the interest rate risk uh, tenor uh, to which our portfolio is the most sensitive to, or what will be the annual margin impact if a uh, spread between one month LIBOR, three months LIBOR gap uh, widens by 100 basis point, or first of all, do we have adequate capital for the portfolio under the different interest rate scenarios? So those are the uh, the main topics which IRBB addresses for the bank, for the banking book. Because please remember, when we talk about IRBB in the banking book, it is quite a different topic when we are talking about market risk in the trading book. There are two different set of rules and they have to be measured and managed differently. And there is the separate set of regulations related to both. So today we will be talking about interest rate risk in the banking book and all related regulations. We won't be talking about the trading book. So let's see where this IRBB exposure sits and how it arise, arises. So first of all, uh, it is um, uh, uh, the bank gains exposure to IRBB because of the business units, because of the activity of origination of assets and gathering the liabilities deposits or uh, funding the banking book of the, or those assets. So for example, Jose funding or uh, different source of funding bo bonds or whatever they are using to fund their assets. So this is, uh, there is the process through FTP process. Uh, the interest rate risk exposure is transfer from the business units to the central unit the central unit was, is the ILM and the ILM is supposed to manage. As I already said and underlined in the FTP webinar, it is not always possible to transfer fully IRBB from the business units to the central unit. And quite often uh, there is some residual IRBB exposure in the uh, business units, which has to be managed by bank. Uh, for example, quite often the basis risk is uh, not always, it is not always possible to manage it. Um, let's look at the, and at the page, uh, which is currently, you are seeing currently. So we have the asset, which is fixed rate loan. Uh, let's imagine it is the bullet loan. So there is no amortization profile and there is the mm, capital uh, payment date. So this is the expiration date of this asset is the let's imagine 31st of December of 2018. And it has the next repricing date, which is equal to the expiration date, obviously, because it is the fixed rate asset. And this asset, let's imagine, is founded by the liability, this time the liability uh, of the same outstanding, so 100, plus is the floating rate note with quarterly re uh, quarterly resetting the rate. So it is uh, the expiration date, is quite shorter. It's uh, 30 June of 2018. And the repricing date, as I said, is quarter. Uh, so we have the next repricing date, assuming that the current date is the 1st January of 2018. 
uh, it is 31st of March 2018. And we can see at the right uh, at the right side of the page of the presentation that of the slide that we have this picture in terms of flows. So when we are talking about IRBB and I will explain it uh, in detail later, we are talking about the flows approach and about the stock approach. What we are seeing on the right side is the flows approach. It means that you can see here uh, the repricing flows and also from the liquidity perspective, because it is the both liquidity interest rate risk profile, uh, it is also the liquidity, pro, uh, liquidity profile. So we have here the repricing for the asset is the same like um, the uh, expiration. So the liquidity profile and interest rate risk profile here is the same. Meanwhile, on the liability side, you can see that there is the difference between the, the liquidity profile of the liability and a repricing of the liability. Given that today we are talking exclusively about IRBB, so we are going to uh, neglect this uh, liquidity profile. And uh, even though, as I said in the ILM optimization webinar, those two risk categories have to be seen integrated and have to be seen together. So it is no, uh, this is the wrong practice or bad practice to see them on the silo basis. But here for the sake of the presentation, uh, we are going to focus only on this repricing component. So we can see here on this flow approach uh, that there is the rate transformation. So in case of the interest rate risk, we are talking about the rate transformation because we are trans transforming the floating rate on the asset side into the uh, into the fixed rate on the uh, floating rate on the liability side, sorry, to the fixed rate on the asset side. So we are funding all better. We are funding the fixed rate asset with the floating rate liabilities. So the repricing profile of your liability is shorter than the repricing profile of asset. This is something which is known as the rate transformation. It is uh, just uh, comparing to the liquidity situation in the liquidity uh, management framework when we are talking about the liquidity uh, maturity transformation. So maturity transformation when we are funding the longer term exp uh, maturity li uh, uh, asset with the shorter term maturity liabilities. So this is something different because the rate transformation is the, uh, related to the interest rate risk. Meanwhile, the liquidity transformation or maturity transformation is related uh, is related to the expiration of the item or asset or liability. Um, below, we can see the mm, stock approach. Uh, as, as you can see, the stock approach is different because here we can see the all stock uh, so outstanding of the asset and of the liability. And here uh, we have the interest rate risk gap, uh, which gives rise to the NIA sensitivity because asset is fixed, as you can see here on the on this flows approach or flows um, uh, view. And here it is closed. Given that it is closed, we on the asset side, we don't have any changes in the risk, which can uh, be driven by changes in interest rates. But on the liability side, we have this gap. So the asset, we don't know what will be the rate on the liability side. So it creates the, um, the NII sensitivity. And for sure, this bank will be the liability sensitive because it has um, the impact in changes in the interest rates will be affecting the liability before it is affecting the asset. So there is Oh, I'm always already introducing the concept of the frequency of repricing. So on the asset side, <clears throat> we have the fixed 
term, so until the expiration of the next uh, repricing, this asset is, is fixed in, ter in terms of rates. On the liability side, it is not fixed. So it will be changing its rates within the next three months. And therefore, there will be the exposure to the, uh, to the uh, interest rate risk because the liability is repricing faster than asset. So this is what is quite important uh, when we are talking about the velocity of repricing of different items on the banking book. From the um, ILM system, uh, you can see the split between those two risks. So interest rate risk is related to the uh, to the movement in the market rates. So we are talking about uh, um, the market base rate um, for different tenors. So here uh, the regulator is, um, is suggesting to use the overnight index swap uh, rates for different uh, maturities. And this is considered as the risk-free rate as for now, we know that there is um, the LIBOR reform currently undergoing, so probably those free rates will be uh, will be different. But currently, uh, as it is in the final report, we have this all overnight index swap rates, which uh, are considered by the regulator risk-free. So this is the discounting factor when which, which will be you, we will be using for the discounting or calculating the market value uh, or present value of uh, items on the, in the banking book, both assets and liabilities. And we can see here the same situation like on the first page. So there is the outstanding uh, in terms of there is this open gap. Let's call it from the IRBB perspective, we are talking about open gaps. So here we have the open gap on the liability side. So this is why this is why it is minus. So the, the bucket exposure, which is the product, uh, it's multiplication of the outstanding multiplied by the length of the time bucket. So this is how we calculated the bucket exposure. And it's quite important because we will be calculating um, the bucket exposure uh, later with the method of the stock approach. So um, it is multiplication of outstanding by the length of the time bucket. This is how we have obtained this number. And this number is important because the stock approach is quite often used for the hedging. And when we are calculating the hedging and the sensi NII sensitivity, uh, which is coming from, uh, from certain positions in the banking book, and we are uh, considering partial or total closure of the time bucket, we will be calculating the time bucket sensitivity or bucket exposure through this method. And then it will be multiplied by the shock, let's say, we can set up the shock um, in the system or you can use the regulatory one, which is in this case 20 basis point. And when we multiplied the shock, so 0.20% or 20 bips multiplied by the bucket exposure, this is the sensitivity. So the sensitivity coming from the IRBB exposure is uh, 0 0.016 in this, in this case. Um, let's uh, see um, the last picture coming from this situation. I've already shown it in the uh, in the ILM optimization webinar, but just for the sake of the um, of the continuation, I would like to underline that the understanding of the trade-off between the profitability and risk. This is the real challenge of the ILM analysis right now. And this is why the modern banking is looking and searching for the new techniques, how to set up this 
optimal target of the banking book. So where is exactly this optimum point in terms of the profitability of the balance between profitability and riskiness of the banking book? And when I'm uh, saying this, I mean also the exposure to IRBB. So there is some benefit because we are doing the rate transformation. So we are funding the, the let's say the rate is supposed to be lower on the liability side. Uh, meanwhile, on the asset side, given that it is um, a longer term repricing, the, the rate interest rate is supposed to be higher. So there will be some uh, spread differential in terms of the market rate uh, between asset and liabilities. And this is what is main rate, main, meant rate transformation. And this is the important factor for the profitability of the banking book and profitability of ILM. But as I said, one point is the profitability, but another point is the risk because this position, if you leave it open, will can bring you some uh, losses in the future and can bring you the excessive exposure, which at some point of the time can damage totally your banking book, can uh, have an impact on the capital, and can also be subject to the regulatory scrutiny. So you need to know what is the appetite of the um, alcohol, what is the appetite of the senior management in terms of the IRBB exposure? This is something which has to be set up by the senior management uh, before any strategy is undertaken. So uh, just to underline the importance of this trade-off between profitability and riskiness is the main question which has to be answered by the senior management. Of course, they will be requiring additional analysis in order to understand uh, what is the exposure on short part, on medium long part of the curve, but they would need to understand what if, so they will be asking the ILM or interest rate risk manager uh, those particular questions, what is our exposure, particular exposure of our bank, if the rates go up or if the key rate exposure, sometimes we are trying to understand what is our tenor, uh, the most important tenor for our bank and which has to be assessed separately, which has to be measured on the frequent basis, which could be potentially closed through hedging strategies. Um, so as I said, uh, let's talk a bit more about IRBB itself, uh, about techniques, how to measure it, how to manage it, their open position, as I said, and then they will be talking about the strategy and strategy in terms of riding the yield curve strategy and how to potentially close it. Um, as I said, we use for IRBB uh, less sophisticated, usually, um, techniques for uh, hedging strategy. However, it is important uh, to know which products, which instruments you have at your disposal to manage uh, IRBB exposure. So, first of all, the IRBB has the impact on the capital um, and uh, it is assessed through ICAP. Uh, you are trying to uh, once a year, you are trying to define uh, through the regulatory methodology and the, um, the recent challenges has provided quite clear methodology for how to assess this capital absorption for IRBB uh, capital, how, how, how big it is and how to calculate it. Uh, then you have to be careful because you have to be compliant with the regulatory landscape which is uh, quite technical and quite complex right now, then you have to uh, take advantage 
of the potential which IRBB exposure can bring to the bank, can bring to the bank, but it is obviously subject to the risk appetite. So what is the appetite? What is the tolerance um, towards this risk category? And then what is the equilibrium between the NII and EVE exposure? So those elements are the key uh, questions which have to be answered. As I said, importance of IRBB is huge because it is, uh, if you manage it properly, it is vital uh, for making money. The bank makes money from IRBB. And uh, you can see very easily that 61% of the total interest income is uh, uh, of the total income is uh, coming from uh, interest income. So it's coming from IRBB. Then you have some 21% uh, coming from the commission income and there is some residual 18% which is other income which the bank can uh, have uh, in the total income. But uh, definitely the most important slice of this income is IRBB, is the interest income. So 61% uh, is important percentage and there is the impact. So if you mismanage this portion, definitely you will lose not only the opportunity for making money for the enhancement because IRBB is the uh, profitability enhancer. So if it's managed well, you can make money. If it's managed badly, you can lose money. Like this bank, this is the example of the international uh, banking group uh, with around 600 billions of risk sensitive assets. And um, during over the many years since financial crisis, so since 2007 uh, to 2014, these banks lost around 3 billion of USD through mismanagement of the IRBB. Why? Because you can easily see what happened in this graph. So uh, you have the um, margin compression in its pure form because the rates were follow falling and you can see it through this black uh, black line, the black line is the f um, is the Federal Reserve rate, um, and uh, the base rate it is the USD obviously base rate. So you can see that it was f falling quite sharply, and since 2009 it has stabilized at very low level. So what does it mean that all floating rate asset? has reprised at the lower rate. So uh, the item, if you were funding those assets with the CASA, so current accounts or savings accounts or non-maturity deposit, which cannot uh, reprise immediately with the market, or you cannot reprise them for the commercial reasons because you don't want to lose your clients, or um, you, it means that you will have the squeeze on the asset side. On the asset side, meanwhile, the liability side will be stable because you cannot reprice it down. And uh, or say differently, the same that it is. Um, it is suffering. The NII, NII, the NIM or NII compression is uh, because of the reinvestment of the CASA and equity, free funds, equity at lower interest rates. So we have this uh, CASA and equity, and we are reinvesting them at the rates we are going, which are going down. This is this arrow. Uh, green arrow, which is going f from 5.5 um, or even 5.6 percent to 1.6, uh, so it is um, it is really quite a big impact. Uh, no, sorry, the name is on the right side, but there is you can see this uh, this drop, so the bank 
has um, lost uh, money in terms of the of the net interest uh, in terms of the NIM because of the floating rate assets. So this bank could, what they could do, they could enter into the structural hedging uh, at the time when the rates were still up because the interest rates are on the left side. So you can see that here we have 5.5% and at that time they could enter into the swaps, uh, into the swaps uh, receivers. So they could uh, lock in the the margin coming from uh, from asset, but they didn't do it, and unfortunately, lack the hedging strategy, proper hedging strategy at that point, um, unfortunately resulted on the overall income or, or result, economic result in terms of IRBB. Uh, we have different types of IRBB. Uh, at least four. Um, the main IRBB categories are repricing risk, basis risk, yield curve risk, and optionality risk. The repricing risk is um, mainly related to the uh, to the rate transformation, as I said, and is driven by the difference in the repricing of tenor profile of assets and liabilities. So imagine, as I said before, that you have to fund the long-term fixed rate asset with the short-term repricing liabilities. So the difference of velocity of repricing between asset and liabilities is the repricing risk. So this is the frequency of repricing. So given that uh, this frequency is important and the timing of repricing is important immediately. It impacts the short part of the curve. Uh, meanwhile, on the medium long part of the curve, we are mainly talking about the yield curve risk. So there is the risk which is coming of, uh, from an anticipated non-parallel movement of the interest rate uh, curve. So, for example, the curve can uh, um, twist or uh, the, it can steepen, uh, it can be inverted, it can uh, flatten. So, it is, um, uh, it is all the scenario which impacts in the non-parallel way uh, the medium-long part of the curve. This is known as yield curve risk. So the second um, uh, IRBB risk category, which is very important and probably one of the most important interest rate risk categories, which is also related to the uh, riding the yield curve strategy. So imagine that you have 30 years bond, uh, which is hedged with the short position in five year bonds. So if the, uh, they are, let's in the time zero, they are perfectly hedged. But uh, if something happens to the uh, 30 years tenor of the curve, there is no more uh, effectiveness in the hedging relationship. So this is um, something which is related to the um, movements which is not uh, parallel, so the different tenors on the um, uh, the movements of the interest rate risk by tenors is not the same, so there are differences. And then you have the optionality risk. Optionality risk is very important. It is related to the um, uh, um, existence of um, a right to prepay mortgage on the asset side by client so they can early redeem um, the, the mortgage because they have this um, contractually um, and then we are 
coming into details of the uh, financial prepayments, of the statistical prepayments, of structural prepayments. So there are different phenomena which drives these movements, but um, prepayment is the optionality which has the impact, important impact on the IRBB. Why? Because if you um, usually you, you hedge um, mortgages, fixed rate mortgages. So imagine that you, on the pooled basis, you are hedging them. So imagine that you have the uh, the group of the uh, the pool of the mortgages, uh, which is uh, the portfolio of mortgages, which is hedged, and then suddenly some portion of those mortgages of those client prepays because of their changes in the rates. So if the rates goes down, then prepayments go up. If the rates go up, then prepayments go down. Goes down. Uh, so there is this. Uh, opposite relationship or inverted relationship between uh, the rates and the prepayment um, behavior. Uh, so then you would need, if the rates go uh, down, the prepayments will go up, and then the hedging relationship uh, of this portfolio, mortgage portfolio, is not uh, is not maintained, and you need to unwind the swap at a loss. So this is something which negatively impact your PNL. And then we are talking about the withdrawal of the non-maturity non -maturity deposit. So this is the most important, probably, and the, the most common uh, optionality which is embedded in the banking book on the on the uh, liability side. So imagine that this, those non-maturity deposit uh, will 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 be shorter than you imagine and uh, you assume that uh, you are naturally hedging some portion of your fixed rate asset uh, by those uh, core uh, liabilities we'll be talking about modeling of non-maturity deposit, at least today in this webinar, I'm going to introduce the topic because the non-maturity deposit has some portion which is known as core or stable and uh, is non price sensitive, not rate sensitive, and this portion can be used to naturally offset the fixed rate assets. So obviously, uh, if this the, the maturity uh, of, of those uh, NIPCA or of those current accounts uh, is shorter than we expect. And obviously, we have the unhedged open position and uh, it can impact negatively the PL of the bank. Also, there can be some idiosyncratic uh, scenario which impact. Uh, the behavior of those clients, of our clients, depositors, and will increase the withdrawal of non-maturity deposit, which again will impact on the higher balance volatility of those clients. And higher volatility uh, means also the impact on the short part of the curve, because uh, obviously they will be, they will be. Uh, repricing at the higher, so you will need to reprice theoretically to reprice them more in order to keep those clients. So um, there are different aspects to how to look at the optionality on the liability side. It is quite a complex topic. For now, I would like to uh, underline that this is optionality risk, but this is not only the behavioral optionality. There are also the automatic options which are embedded in the banking book. For example, the floors. The floors which are embedded into the contractual loans and which protects against uh, going uh, in the negative, going uh, in terms of the interest rates, obviously, going into the negative territory. So if the rates are at the negative level, for example, minus 0 0.38, we are locked at the 0% level. So uh, 
we are protected against margin compression through this embedded floor into the in the asset, into the contract. This is the contractual um, floor, but it has to be calculated also according to the new IRBB guidelines with, uh, with the robust methodological approach, which is uh, our bachelor model or black 76, you have to price them and you have to price them with the certain assumptions which are given by the regulators. regulator. So for example, Basel 368 suggests that you have to increase the uh, rate volatility by 25%, that you have to uh, calculate the value of this embedded uh, IRO interest rate options under six regulatory scenario and uh, plus this uh, changes into volatility rate volatility and then you will add this value to the economic total economic value uh, of, of the banking book so uh, there are automatic options which are always executed if there is the rational economic rational for for the ex, um, exercise of these options so there are floors caps collars um, which swaptions which are always executed when it is convenient for the option holder to execute it so uh, this is this is why we call them automatic and then we have those behavioral which is driven by the human factor a behavioral factor which is not always rational and uh, this is why we are talking about behavioral optionality so those two has to be separated very clearly so there is also the basis risk uh, the fourth category basis risk is important it is important uh, also because uh, we are on the LIBOR reform and they will be important problem with the basis risk uh, so it is quite hot topic at the moment so basis risk is arising from the imperfect correlation between different risk factors on asset and liability uh, imagine that you are um, uh, on the asset side uh, the one year UK government bond which is obviously uh, one year so it is the same uh, let's say maturity like the funding of this bond because it is founded by the one year deposit let's imagine index to the LIBOR three months so it is with quarterly repricing so the, the maturity is the same but the deposit, uh, so the, the liability is indexed to the LIBOR three months, so it's repricing on the quarterly basis. And the risk factor here, the underlying risk factor is LIBOR three months. So we have different risk factors, different curves, and those curves absolutely, it's not possible that they will be moving in the same uh, perfectly in the same direction by the same amount extent. So if, for example, um, the UK uh, government bond will expire and let's imagine that uh, we are founding it with this uh, one year deposit, uh, which is priced off on LIBOR, LIBOR curve, it's impossible that if it's moved, for example, uh, by 10%, the UK government curve you, you will move by 20 basis points, the same will happen to the, uh, to the LIBOR three months. So it's impossible. This is imperfect correlation. And this imperfect correlation is not only related to the difference in the risk factors. It is also because of the different curves. So we have the government curve like here and we have the LIBOR curve like uh, on the liability side in, in case of this deposit. But we also have uh, administered trade product, for example, 
Non-maturity deposit is the typical example of, uh, of administered products. Pro administered products are the products which the bank can adjust the rates at their leisure of the at day um, willingness. So if they want to change it, they change and they communicate to the client, uh, we are changing the rates and uh, this option is held by the bank. So the bank has also the option and they can change it at just the rates. And usually when the market rates are moving, uh, fluctuating, um, the administered rate products are changing uh, with some lag, temporary lag, and never by the same extent. So if the, the bank wants to pass through the rates to the clients, this is the term which is used for the non-maturity deposit, if the bank wants to reprice the liability side or the, to pass the changes in the rate to depositors, it will, it can do, but it is almost certain that it will be not by the same extent. So it pass only 30% or 20% of the market rate movements to the client. Um, sometimes it can pass through zero. So it depends um, on the bank, what is the extent of the um, senior management, what is their belief the client can react to this market movement. So if the, 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 the market, the rates in the market with, will move only slightly, it is rather um, unlikely that the bank will reprice uh, the, the, the deposit base. But when the rates are going quite sharply up or down, then the bank will need to catch up to some extent to those changes. Um, so this is another uh, example of the basis risk, uh, because yes, even if you, you, you can tell me, yeah, but uh, the bank can adjust it. So there is no risk. I, I quite often I, I heard it from, uh, from some uh, management that uh, it is in, we don't have any basis risk exposure because we can always adjust our uh, our deposit side. So even though the asset uh, floating rate assets rates are changing, but we can al always uh, adjust the liability side. It's not really because there is always some temporary lag. So. Uh, in my view, there is the risk exposure, basis risk exposure, which is uh, coming from non-maturity deposit and the fact that there is always the temporary lag in terms of repricing. And then the next example of the basis risk, uh, obviously the, uh, for example, uh, the base rate, which is changing um, in the direction, in the by the discrete, uh, manner in the discrete manner. So, for example, imagine that the prime mortgages, which are quite common in UK, the the prime mortgages are the mortgages which are based of uh, a price of sorry base rate, and when uh, the base rate is uh, changing, then they are adjusting the price on the on the mortgages so the this those mortgages will be moving by discrete level uh, so because obviously the base rate is moving like steps it's not it's not fluctuating it is discrete meanwhile the liability will be fluctuating so there is always the uh, this Again, this not perfect, uh, exactly not perfect correlation because meanwhile the base rate uh, set up at the certain level, the, uh, the floating rate liabilities will be fluctuating and will be moving. We'll be talking about uh, basis risk in detail a bit, uh, a bit later. For now, uh, let's remember that there is uh, the potential for the complex risk uh, and the complex risk are those four in terms of IRBB. So the institution needs the robust risk identification process, uh, especially when they design the new products. So they have to be able to 
identify uh, what will be the risk interest rate risk category which is related to the certain product and in this new uh, product assessment this is the important uh, important uh, factor and institution should have the risk function which are capable of identifying and challenging first of all challenging the first line owner of the risk interest rate risk in the banking book and here is about um, we are entering already into the segregation which will be analyzed a bit later uh, so we have the first line first line owner of the irbb which is for example treasury and the treasury is uh rising uh, the, the exposure is generating the IRBB exposure but then because for example it has the treasury book and it is investing in the certain kind of bonds uh, imagine for the simplicity that those are fixed rate bonds with the duration of five years and they are generated they are buying those five years bonds uh, in order not only to have the high quality liquid asset uh, but also for the treasury book in order to um, uh, to make money uh, on those instruments and uh, then imagine that you those bonds are funded by uh, by liabilities which uh, uh, which has for example floating rate liabilities so they are um, they are rising some uh, short term wholesale funding in order to fund them so definitely they are owner of the interest rate first owner of the interest rate risk exposure in this case so there is a need to have the certain line uh, second line uh, certain uh, department which is the risk department which will or, or treasure risk a person who is responsible to challenge those risks which are or to challenge the owner the treasury um, why and what is the strategy to, to calculate recalculated the exposure to monitor if the exposure which treasury is taking on is not excessive uh, so this is exactly the separation in terms of the uh, duties uh, it's very important but this is the the next point on which we are talking let's come <clears throat> into details for the different uh, interest rate risk categories as i said one is the repricing risk the repricing risk is again i would like to uh, recall it it is the difference in the repricing velocity between asset and liabilities i like to show this uh, uh, this picture on the right side of the slide so we have the asset in the repricing and liability in repricing which is a bit um, it's repricing a bit later than asset because the cutoff date we have the cutoff date which is the date of the analysis uh, and then we have the asset which is repricing exactly after one month uh, if we have the monthly time bucket so uh, you see that this asset uh, is repricing in august and we are in july and then what happens that the liability is repricing in december so uh, the velocity of repricing for asset is higher than the velocity of repricing for liabilities it means that on the short part of the curve the bank is the asset sensitive so the bank has taken the asset sensitive position on the short part of the curve this is exactly how it is known and this uh, expose the bank to the downward movement of the curve on the short part under the short term horizon what does it mean usually irbb is split between the 
short term, which is up to 12 months usually, the gapping period or the time of the analysis, the horizon for the short part of the curve, for the short term analysis for IRBB, which is known NII sensitivity analysis, is usually up to one year, sometimes two years or sometimes even three years, but uh, the, the higher, the longer uh, gapping period, the higher risk that you don't have uh, the number the, in terms of the NII sens sensitivity right, because obviously there is the risk that in terms of the modeling of the Mm, of the future gaps, you you have some you miss some uh, some additional. So, for example, you don't roll over exactly like it is. So, like it should be, and there are some mm, uh, some errors in the assumptions in, in, in longer term horizon in the longer term horizon. So, it's better to focus on the twelve months and uh, regulator for the ongoing analysis, IRBB analysis asks for 12, 12 month time horizon. Uh, and this is known NII sensitivity analysis. Meanwhile, the medium long part of the curve analysis, it is something which is beyond one year up to the end of the life of the banking book. So you are talking about something which is longer than 12 months. So the first analysis, which is NII sensitivity analysis, is stopping uh, at 12 months. It is not looking what is beyond one year. So gaps which are over beyond one year are not analyzed. Meanwhile, the second portion is analyzing the uh, the whole gaps, but with uh, the different view and the different um, objective. So it is uh, the objective variable in this case is the economic value, not earnings. And meanwhile, in the first analysis, it is earnings. So here we are talking about the first kind of the analysis and the repricing risk is mainly um, seen or analyzed for the NII sensitivity through the repricing gap analysis. So there is the tool which is known a repricing gap analysis which is showing all gaps existing into the banking book as of the cutoff date uh, under the horizon of gap, 12 months of gapping period. And then you can assess how big, um, if first of all, if you are asset sensitive or if you are liability sensitive, how big uh, the gap is and uh, if you are exposed to the upward or downward movements of the curve. So this is a positioning, active positioning of the interest rate, uh, of the interest rate risk in the banking book. So the positioning in treasury or in ILM. So it's known as, uh, the, no, the name for this particular strategy is directional gap analysis. So we are trying to, <clears throat> predict, forecast what will be the future movement of the interest rates and if it will be upward trend, then obviously you are going to take this asset sensitive position instead of liability sensitive position, because if the rates go up, then you will benefit. And the opposite, if the rates are going down, so you won't position your banking book in terms of the asset sensitive position on the short part of the curve, because you will be hit by the, um, by the rates which the reduction in the interest rates. So this is something which uh, the strategy has to be well known to the treasurer and uh, he needs, he has some different tools to manage it. Uh, 
how to close, for example, uh, the excessive gaps on the short part of the curve, or if, for example, he wants to, usually he does it through the interbank transactions, and um, he can also use some uh, derivatives in order to close the excessive gaps, uh, for example, forward rate agreement. So this is the, mm, the first uh, interest rate risk category, which uh, drives the NII sensitivity.